We appreciate uh, everyone being back tonight, and we always look forward to the midweek Bible study that we have. It is a good time that we can center our minds in together in the fellowship, the study of God's word, even though it be an electronical situation. Before I leave the topic of fellowship, and although we went through it, uh, I think last week, and you've heard it many times, I want us to go back to 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 7. A little bit of this will be repeat, but I want to emphasize these things because I don't know that they're as well understood as they ought to be by faithful members of the Lord's church, Christians. You're familiar with John's comments here, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Well, that's a wonderful statement because it certainly reminds us that, as the old song has to say, there's power in the blood. Whose blood? The shed blood of Jesus Christ. The only reason he shed his blood is for the remission of our sins. Acts 20 and 28 says that the church that he promised to build, Matthew 16, 18, and that he did build beginning in Acts chapter 2, which Luke records by inspiration, is a blood-bought institution. We need to understand then that institution is made up of individual members. Those members, in order to become members, heard the gospel of Christ because that's God's power to save, Romans 1.16. And upon believing it, the very fact they did means they believed in Christ, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, as the Son of God. And they complied with the rest of the requirements that the Lord set forth in that gospel in order for one to become a Christian. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. A member of the church that Jesus built, established long before denominationalism or Catholicism or uh, Islam or anything like that. The only way you can get a pure picture of that church is to read your Bible in general and the New Testament specifically. The New Testament of the Bible is the last will and testament of Jesus Christ revealed to the New Testament writers by the Holy Spirit so that they would infallibly record the will of Jesus Christ concerning how to become a Christian, that is, how to be saved from sin, at what point one is saved from sin, and how one becomes a member of the church that he built, which, remember, is the blood-bought institution. He shed his blood for the remission of our sins. He invites all to become a member of it. They must be humble, teachable, and ready to receive with meekness the engrafted word. American Standard says the implanted word, which is able to save our souls. Well, it's able to save our souls. It doesn't mean it will, but it's able to because it requires something on our part. That is to receive it, to be instructed by it. That involves understanding. And thus, we're taught the gospel of Christ. First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, sets out fundamentally the first principles of the gospel. And we need to remember that as we have come to believe in him through the evidence of the truth in the word of Christ, the gospel, Romans 10, 17. Then one is commanded to repent of sins, that is, will to turn away from a practiced habitual life of sin, Acts 17, 30. Then to confess one's faith in Christ, that he is the Son of God, Romans chapter 10, verse 10. And to complete one's obedience to the gospel, to be immersed in water, by the authority of Jesus Christ into a saved relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And thus, one is being baptized for the remission of sins. Acts 2, verse 38, Matthew 28, verses following. 
we need to remember that because that's how we become Christians. Now, let me be very bold here and clear. If you don't believe and obey that from the heart, Romans 6, 17, and 18, you'll never become a Christian. You will die in your sins. That's the one singular, powerful gospel of Jesus Christ. And a great many people may believe that Christ is the Son of God, but that does not mean they're willing to receive his teachings on how to become a Christian and when one becomes a Christian. So once one has done that, then you find the rest of the New Testament, for the most part, as we've said on numerous occasions, is written to Christians to keep them faithful. We started the whole first chapter of John by pouring that out. John was writing to these people as he wrote part of the New Testament, and these people were Christians of the first century, telling them how to be faithful and to remain faithful. Now, when you come to verse 7, but if we walk in the light, he is in the light, we're concerned about fellowship because that's in the context of fellowship, of this sharing we have, first of all, with God through our obedience to the gospel and having our sins washed away in the blood of the Lamb when we were baptized, and then raised to walk in newness of life. We're new creatures in Christ. We now need to continue to walk in the light. Now, we spend a lot of time as to the meaning of light here. It means the truth of God. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, notice the continue. That's uh, continuing means to not cease. So if we continue to walk in the light, then we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That's where we started. So the fellowship that Christians enjoy one with another in this blood-bought institution, the church, to which our Lord added us when we were baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, Galatians 3.26, is the family of God. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. And everybody in that church was remaining in fellowship with God because first of all, before we can fellowship one another, we must be in fellowship with God. No fellowship with God means no fellowship with faithful members of God's family, the church. I think it's important to note this concerning the inspired apostle John and what he has to say here. John emphasizes that walking in the light let me, I don't know how bold I can say this, but let me, let me say always precedes fellowship one with another. Walking in the light always precedes fellowship one with another. That is one Christian with another Christian. Now let's emphasize this too, that the phrase walking in the light Although we've said it many times, it needs to be pounded in our minds, I suppose you can say. It means that we are to live in harmony with or in faithful obedience to the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Not some sort of man-made church manual, catechism, prayer book, or the dictates of a human council or the Pope in Rome, or any of the councils of the Roman Catholic Church, or anything the Roman Catholic Church teaches, or the Eastern Orthodox Church, or anybody that claims a latter revelation for what you have in your Bible. It is once for all delivered, so Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 1. So we have in the Bible all that one needs to know how to become a Christian and live the Christian life, or in other words, to walk in the light. Now, with this principle in mind also, I want us to see what is meant further by walking the light as he is in the light. I don't know how many years ago it was, but a long time ago. It just dawned on me one day when I was reading John, 1 John 1, 7, how it paralleled another passage, both passages I'd taught over years. 
but how do they parallel one another? And anytime you can have the Bible giving you in one scripture deeper insight or the understanding better of another scripture, then you have a divine commentary. And I suggest you lay alongside 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. Luke records Acts 2, 42 in the midst of writing about the church being established in Jerusalem. And in that passage, which we have gotten into some lately, it says of those who were baptized for the remission of sins, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. Now take that verse and put it alongside 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Now, I put together some true-false statements at that time just to check my thinking on it. And I have these here, four, and we'll just go through them, four of them. It won't take any more than this. could take less, but it won't take any more than this. First statement. This first statement is a precisely stated statement. Thus, it must be true or it must be false. True or false, it is possible to walk in the light and not continue steadfastly the apostles' doctrine. True or false? Second one, true or false? It is possible to continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and not walk in the light. Number three, true or false? It is possible from God's point of view to have fellowship one with another and not walk in the light. And then the last one, number four, true or false? It is possible from God's point of view to have fellowship one with another and not continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Well, statements one and two are false. To walk in the light is to continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and vice versa. If, from God's point of view, fellowship exists between people only when they are in fellowship with him, then statements three and four must be false. Acts chapter two, verse 42 and 1 John 1, verse 7, so affirm, and I would simply say, if not, why not? The conclusion is that to walk in the light is the same as continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Now, I added this to, in the discussion one time I had, to this particular thing. I said, can you conceive of somebody continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and not walking in the light as he's in the light? Or can you conceive of somebody walking in the light as he is in the light and not continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine? Now, this is what I mean is the value of thinking a thing through. Challenge yourself and your thinking, and it's a way of making sure you're right, because God wants us to be right. You know, this is one of the things that when you look around through the religious world, you get the idea that God doesn't care whether we're right or not. Or maybe there is no real objective right and no real objective wrong. But there is. There's a real objective right. And there's a real objective wrong. And thus, God expects us to understand the right. That's why he gave us his word. Now go back and read 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, and you'll see that's exactly what he's saying. He's telling us how to be right. But more than that, he's telling us how we can know we're right. So saying goes, you can take that to the bank. Now, he went ahead and said in this as the second part of verse 7, 
and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. I think, again, that needs further explanation, though we spent some time on it. And over the years, I've spent numerous occasions talking about it. But notice as fellowship one with another is possible only, let me underscore that, only as one lives in harmony with the doctrine of Christ, as one submits to the teachings that Christ has for the church in order to be faithful, even so, the cleansing power of the blood of Christ is totally dependent on the same conditions. The word cleanse here cleanses us from all sin is from the Greek word hatharitsai. Now, that's a present tense verb, and we've talked about that a lot of times as far as what a present tense verb in the Greek language is not like present tense in English. Sometimes it's described as linear action. That is, it starts and doesn't stop. So you draw a line there. It's linear action. It means as one continues to walk in the light, the blood of Christ continues to cleanse one from all sin, every kind and every form. Now remember, sin is the transgression of God's law. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Now, if we have fellowship one with another without walking in the light as he is in the light, may we not have the continual application of the cleansing power of uh, the blood of Christ while we're walking outside the light? I don't think so. One walks in the light as one walks according to the teachings of Christ, the truth. And thus, the blood cleanses those who are in the truth, who live by the truth. Who are those people? When did they first contact, as it were, the efficaciousness of the blood of Christ that he shed on Calvary's cross? Well, if you'll read Romans chapter 6, You'll see he's writing to Christians there. They had heard, believed, and obeyed the gospel. And he reminds them of what they had done to obey the gospel, to urge them, to exhort them, to rebuke them, possibly, to continue to live faithful to God or to walk in the light. Now, we were baptized in the death of Christ, if we were baptized scripturally. Thus, we contact the blood of Christ. Why? He shed his blood in his death on the cross. Now, we know very well he, you're not going to have the actual human blood of Jesus Christ applied to you. You might think, well, how can I go back and stand beneath the cross of Christ, the actual cross of Christ, while he's still nailed to it and have his blood actually drip upon me? How can I go with his dead body into the tomb have the stone rolled in front of the door of it. Then when he was raised on the first day of the week, did I no more come out with him? Well, it's an impossibility. But it's not impossible to obey a form of doctrine. What was that form of doctrine? We'll go back and read 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 again. But then especially, you'll see it explained in Romans 6, 7, and 18. We became the servants of sin when we obeyed that form of doctrine. What was it? A form of the death, the burial, resurrection of Christ. When do we do that? When we become a Christian? As a believer who's repented of sins and confessed faith in Christ, we are buried with him by baptism, Romans 6, 3 and 4, Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. And we're raised to walk in the midst of life. A new creature in Christ. Old sins are washed away. And thus the Lord adds us to his spiritual body, the church, where the blood continues to flow as we walk in the light or as we're steadfast in the apostles' doctrine living our lives. This is a very important point. You'll remember that Paul wrote to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 4 and verse number 8. And he's quoting in that verse, Psalm 32, 1 and 2. 
where David uh, pointed out these things that he applies to those who are reconciled to God, whose sins are forgiven. And he says simply, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. You can also read that in another, other translations have, blessed is the Lord to whom, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not reckon sin. It's actually a counting term in Greek. That's amazing. When I read that, and I couldn't tell you how long ago, a long time ago when I first read that. And I thought, you can actually live in this world and God will not reckon your sins to you. Now that ought to raise some eyebrows. Remember, sin's the only thing that can separate you from God. That God solved the sin problem through Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus meant, among other things. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto me or unto the Father but by me, John 14, 6. Well, Paul's writing to Christians. Remember that when he wrote Romans. And if you look at the context, he's talking about our salvation, what we enjoy as faithful Christians. He's talking about the same people John's talking about in 1 John chapter 1. And the fellowship we have with God allows us to be in fellowship with others who obey the same gospel, God's power to save, Romans 1 16. And thus, we do not have our sins imputed to us. It's of great comfort then for us to realize that as one is steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. That one is constantly washed and made clean from all sins by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes we get I get the idea that people are thinking that not only does God not want us to be right or doesn't care whether we are right or wrong, if there is a right or wrong, but that he's really looking for an opportunity to cause us to lose our souls. Uh, no, there's no being in existence that wants us to be saved more than God Almighty. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now there it is. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Some people read that verse and they forget there are other verses in the Bible. And they say, see, all you have to do is just believe only and that's it. Well, that's not it. If that were the only verse in the Bible, then you wouldn't need any other verses concerning it exactly at what point one saved. But you do have other verses in the Bible addressing the same idea. That is God's love for us and how he saves us when he saves us. So, we realize that uh, that same Jesus talked about, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. They even talked about confessing him before men and said, if you don't confess me before men, I will not confess you before my father. And of course, he talked about being baptized. He said in the Great Commission of Mark 16, 15 and 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Well, then what do we do? We take the totality of what the Bible teaches concerning what God requires of one to become a Christian or for that one's sins to be forgiven by him. And when that happens, we've already studied Acts 2 and saw that those that glad had received his word were baptized, the Lord added to the church, those that should be saved. Acts 2, 41, 42, and 47. Now, what are the signs or any indicators of when one is walking in the light is the agreement on the part of the child of God with the father that he has sinned it's his fault he can't blame anybody else he's in the mess he's in because he put himself in that mess and that person must then realize that 
that one is in need of what only God can provide to keep him or her pure from sin. As now growth of the preceding stated reality, whatever specific sin is committed, one who is faithful to the Lord is going to recognize it and confess it and pray God for forgiveness. That's taught also, you know, in verse 10 or 9 of First John 1. Pins tied in with it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. I like to look just for a moment at the word confess. James 5, 16 is where I'm going to get the word confess. It uh, comes from a rather long Greek word, hologomen, hologomen. It's the present active subjunctive of homologeo, and it means that one must keep on confessing one's sins. It's a continual thing. I think I touched on this last week, but I didn't go into the details of it and why we view it that way uh, more uh, than I did last week. The attitude of the Christian is that I'm not saved by perfect law system. I'm saved by faith system. What does that mean? Simply because I do what God requires of me to become a Christian, live a Christian life, doesn't mean that everything about me is just what God wants. Now, a lot of people running, they, I guess it's sort of like um, try, can, trying to conceive with them of, of something that doesn't have a beginning or an ending. And their, their mind just kind of locks up. Well, we live under a faith system that involves law. James 1, verse 25, we're to walk in the perfect law of liberty. But that's the same thing as saying what is said in Acts 2, 42, or 1 John 1, 7. If you look at Abraham, you'll see that several occasions he didn't do things that were right. I found it very when I say right, I don't mean what God told him to do. And he said, I'm not going to do it. I don't care if I do sin against you. That wasn't at all Abraham's attitude. And it never has been the attitude of a faithful child of God or servant of God any time in the world, time of existence, whether patriarchal age, mosaical age, or present Christian dispensation. When Abraham was told to do something with God, he did it. There were a few times in his life when he pulled some good ones, such as getting himself into trouble, and his wife too, with Pharaoh and then later Abimelech. And have you ever noticed, which is rather interesting, you might want to think about it for a while, that he promised Abraham that whoever Curses you, I will curse you, that person. Have you ever noticed that? How far did he go with that? Well, when Pharaoh took Abraham's wife, not knowing Sarah was Abraham's wife, into his household, God began to plague him. You know, Pharaoh was completely innocent of that he didn't know and he didn't know because abraham sarah had agreed to say she's my sister well the way they reckon things then she was his half sister did the same thing with abimelech and abimelech chided him for it but you know in both cases when pharaoh took sarah and abimelech took Sarah, God plagued their houses and it was not their fault. Might think about that for a while and blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. 
doesn't mean anybody. In fact, it means right the opposite. Who's a member of the church, who's a Christian, and say, well, I'm just going to do wrong what the Bible teaches. I'm just going to do wrong. It doesn't mean that at all. It means that as you're striving to know the truth and to walk steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and continuing in the light, then these mistakes of ignorance and weakness, God will take care of. Now, question, if it doesn't mean that, what's going to take care of your weaknesses and ignorance? And you know, if it's a sin of ignorance, you don't know about it or you wouldn't be ignorant of it. That's what I don't understand some people's thinking. Now, you can't very well think any different about that than that. Grace enters in. We are in being in the church in a state of grace. I don't intend denominations who don't understand salvation by grace through an obedient faith. I don't intend for them to run me off of the biblical teaching on grace, God's favor that none of us deserve and cannot merit but that we humbly receive by belief and obedience to the gospel. There has to be a way for free moral agents who are sinful men to receive what God freely gives them to give to them. Now, if they don't do it by obeying it, how are they going to receive it? So it becomes rather obvious then for those of us who have humbly from the heart obeyed the gospel of Christ, the Lord's address to the church, the blood was applied to the waters of baptism as it were, and it continues to be applied as we walk in the light, see the light, or continue steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. Blessed is that man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. The grace of God continues to bless him. And we're striving all we can to bring our lives in subjection to Christ. Now, a number of us here have been members of the church a long, long time. Others, not so long. Maybe some aren't. But I ask those of you who've been in the church for a number of years, have you grown your knowledge and understanding of Christianity in those years since you were baptized? You're more enlightened now than you were years ago when you obeyed the gospel. You're not a babe in Christ anymore, hopefully. Well, what kept you reconciled to God and justified in his sight? as you made that journey from some ignorance as a babe and then hungry and thirsting after rations and studying, you reached where you are today. What kept you safe in the arms of Jesus? If it was not the blood continued applied by the grace of God as you walked in the light as he was in the light. We always talk about as Christians, one must grow from a babe, one who just become a Christian, into a mature person. Spiritually speaking, well, what takes care of us while we do that? Blessed is a man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Well, how does that happen? The blood of Christ must continue to cleanse us. That's the only way it can happen. No other way it can happen. Paul declared that all of sin comes short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. John says to children of God that Christ is the propitiation for our sins. That's speaking to Christians. 1 John 2 and verse 2. And God has put all accountable mankind under the curse of sin. That is the wages of sin is death. Romans 6 and verse 23. John plainly said that we cannot say, even as members of the church, that we have no sin. But there's a big difference in a person who's an habitual sinner who doesn't care about God nor anything about the Bible and wants to live his life as it suits himself according to sensual appetites here on earth. That person even will do a good thing time now and then. Well, turn it around. The faithful child of God is one who habitually works to be obedient to God. He reminds himself daily and everybody else that the conclusion of the whole matter is to fear God and keep his commandments. Well, this is the whole duty of man. But he will from time to time sin. Or there wouldn't be any statement here that John makes in 1 John 1 and verse 9 uh, saying that we must confess our sins. So let's keep that in mind. What keeps us reconciled to God and saved in the church is the blood of Christ 
And that keeps us in fellowship with God and everybody else who lives the Christian life. So, of course, God can't lie. So I believe he told us the truth when he said, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. I want to know who that man is because I want to be like him. Now, when we're thinking about fellowship, when we're thinking about all the good things that the New Testament reveals are for Christians, let's not forget that it's in Christ where he's located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Fellowship will be one of them. And the hope of heaven that comes through the shed blood of Christ that continually cleanses us from sin is certainly one of them. By the way, that's one of the things that saves us because we can look beyond this veil of tears, and the problems we have in life, and know that these things will all come to an end. There's heaven awaiting, truly, for all who love God and keep his commandments, who spend his or her life in the church of the living God, glorifying God in belief of the Son and obedience to his will. And that involves part of that faithfulness, seeing any sins we commit, aware of our sins of weakness, knowing we may commit sins of ignorance, and praying always to God for forgiveness, the willingness when we see specific sins to confess them and pray God for forgiveness. That's all a part of being faithful. I'll leave you with this tonight. I've said this many times before, and I hope to be able to say it as long as I can teach. The people who are deeply concerned about whether they're in sin or not, or they're concerned about needing to know more Bible or living more in harmony with it, are usually the ones that are more concerned about, well, am I, am I, am I going to heaven? I suggest to you that the person who's really faithful to God as the New Testament defines faithfulness on the part of a member of the Lord's church is that person who is constantly reviewing his or her life, constantly looking through their minds and then their actions to say, am I living as the Lord authorizes me to live? That's one of the signs that we are on God's side is that we have that kind of in-depth, constant, regular concern that we're striving to obey the truth. That person will grow and develop and that person is the man or the woman or the boy or the girl to whom the Lord will not reckon or impute sin. Thus, on the day of judgment, that person appearing before the great judgment seat of Christ will hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. Thank you. Would you bow with me now for a word of prayer? Our holy and righteous Father in heaven, we come before thee to glorify thee through Christ Jesus, thy Son and our Savior. We're thankful we can meditate on the fellowship thou hast given us in the Lord's church, how we come into it, and the fellowship we have as brothers and sisters in it, and how we may continue to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Help our lives to be dedicated to knowing the truth, to learning it, to teaching it to others, defending it, and that we'll build in us a desire to live more on the level of the teaching of the New Testament, for that's the way we live spiritually. God of mercy, help us to care one for another, be with those who are ill in various ways, and our brethren throughout the world. Help us to realize there'll be brethren in heaven who are on this earth now, that we won't know till we reach glory. So help us to pray for them, help us to be mindful of ourselves and know that they pray for us and help us, Father, to be righteous before thee according to thy whole gospel system of righteousness. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.